This episode, I'm joined once again by writer and occultist John Michael Greer to discuss the cyclic nature of history and consciousness. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast, if you've enjoyed anything that's been published this year, then please find links in the description below for the Patreon. Otherwise, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas Day, and please enjoy. So, John Michael Greer, thanks once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you very much for having me on. And uh, as is the tradition on this podcast now, it's become a tradition, uh, this will go out live Christmas Day. So uh, Merry Christmas to everyone listening. And, and, you know, happy four days past solstice to everyone else. <laughs> That's the one I was going to ask. I mean, what, so is that the, the druid, druid yeah, the, um, solstice? Well, insofar as druids do anything in common, um, you know, yeah. it's the usual thing. Ask three druids, get at least five answers. Um, yeah, the solstices and the equinoxes are important to us. And so the, the one of the advantages of being a druid is you get to open your presents four days early. Ah. And then yeah, I think, I think, uh, it differs, in, differs in country as well, I think, uh, in terms of what day many people actually celebrate. So a lot of people celebrate on what would... I would know it's Christmas Eve, and mm -hmm, I enjoy the right. season anyway. I don't enjoy the specific days. Oh, so I enjoy the season. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a lovely season. <laughs> but there we go. Anyway, we're going to discuss collapse and civilizational descent. Yes, um, and here under the Christmas tree, you have <laughs> the, down, the decline and fall of Western civilization. Exactly. I, I expect exactly. oohs and ahs, yes. <laughs> so it's been, a long, it's been a long time. I mean, we used to, years ago now, time flies, mm -hmm. Uh, time flies when you're just discussing collapse. Well, well, time flies when the world is collapsing. Um, you know, we used to discuss this, and then and then you moved from the Arcturid Report through to Echo Sophia, and mm -hmm. um, you know, the, with the emphasis there being, you know, this in between of ecology and, and um, uh, esotericism, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and not so much emphatically like the Arcturid Report, which was more on the decline uh, of the West. So there's mm -hmm. always been this mixture. But so many people have asked, you know, can we can we do an update? And it seemed like oh, yeah. time because. Uh, the world has become almost like a caricature now of if you don't see it, where are you looking? But I actually want to, uh, I mean, it's probably a really, really broad discussion as per usual, mm -hmm. but I actually want to begin um, mm -hmm. with your studies probably many, many years ago. Um, so you, I believe as your undergrad, you studied, was it comparative religion? No, I actually, I had a complex uh, college career. And um, the degree I ended up with was comparative history of ideas. Comparative history of ideas. Okay. That's where I got the comparative mm. thing from. Yes. Now, the reason uh, yeah, you, want... you, you, you got part of it right, certainly. Go <laughs> ahead. Now, the reason I want to start with that is I know that you are uh, a fan of the works of Spengler and Toynbee, uh, mm -hmm. the two historians who, the two most notable historians mm -hmm. who have um, written these cyclical theories of history. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just want to begin with the question of, can you remember first coming across either of their work and sort of what, as we're speaking about the decline of, of, of you know, and collapse, I mean, I think these mm -hmm. two things are key to look at. You know, I guess the question is, you know, was it like, ah, okay, finally someone hasn't written a sort of, uh, you know, biased mm -hmm. reading of history? And and also, why, why do you think they're avoided? Because it still seems so many people are just even reluctant mm -hmm. to touch mm -hmm. their work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Toynbee, I, Toynbee goes back a long ways. There was a copy of the one volume edition of the of condensation of Toyn's being study of history um, in the family room when I was a child. We had big bookshelves. My dad read a lot. And so there was a I don't know why he got it or when he first when he read it or what he thought of it. Really, I don't, I don't think we ever talked about that. But there was a copy. And so I, I, I made note of it. I didn't read it at the time. Um, I happened to stumble across it years later in um, – this would be in the Seattle Public Library when I lived in Seattle. They had a copy. I said, hey, it's in history. Check it out. And my immediate response was, okay, that's interesting, but I'm not sure that it follows. I thought that there was very clearly – now, of course, this is the one-volume thing. It was a lot of stuff very condensed down. I was saying, okay, you're making a very specific case here. I'm not sure that you know, – there's, there's a lot that's being left out here. And I wasn't quite ready to go plunge into the 12 hefty volumes that actually make up Toynbee's work. Um, that happened later. Um, the, the later in question was when I encountered Spengler 
Um, and that was literally, I was on my way to a peak oil event. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this was early on in, in my, in my period of peak oil activism. I just started being invited to, inv- to events around the country. And so I was traveling to this and I had, I, of course, I wanted a book so that I had something to, um, some, something to read while going through the miseries of travel. And I had, so I had Toynbee, I had, no, I had Spengler's first volume, the first of his two volumes of the decline of the West. And I was sitting there in in the waiting room in the train station, waiting for the waiting for the train to arrive, and reading this thing and going, "Oh boy, this explains so much." Mm. And the thing the thing about the thing about Spengler, um, the reason that it explains so much is that he made it very very clear he was not talking about causes. He was setting the entire issue of what causes decline and fall aside and saying, how does it happen? Are there, is there a comparative morphology here? Is there a, a set of patterns that we can see recurring over time? And then he showed that, yes, there is. And so that, that movement to morphology, that shift toward, you know, we can bicker about the causes later, what actually happens, struck me as extremely fruitful. And then watching his his delineation, you know, in 1918, he's setting out, this is what we can expect Western civilization to go through from here on in. And I'm just going, okay, check that box, check that box, check that box, to down page after page. A hundred years, you know, nearly, at that point, nearly a century on. Now, of course, it's been more than a century. And he was just hitting hitting one, to use an Americanism, he was hitting one out of the ballpark after another. And so that was the point where I went, okay, I need to go back and read Arnold Toynbee. And the library system where I then lived had, you know, they had copies of the whole set. And so I slogged through it and finally saved up the money to buy a copy. <clears throat> and so that I could really brood over it. And came to the conclusion that Spengler, Spengler had the morphology, I think, down better than most better than any of the others. Um, Toynbee talks about causation, and he talks about it in a way that actually works, and he makes some very, very good points. Both of them need to be understood, I think, in each other's context. There are some other theories of cyclical history that also deserve inclusion in that. But why doesn't anybody talk about Spengler and Toynbee these days? It's because they're right. <laughs> you know, the worst thing you can do is be um, right in, in, in any society is to be right in an unpopular way. We have this myth of progress. We have this belief that, you know, the future is ours. We are destined to go onward and upward in this grand march from the caves to the stars. And, you know, and, and everything has to get better because we believe in progress. Progress is, is the god of Western civilization. And Spengler and Toynbee, and Giambattista Vico, and some of the other people that I've read uh, that, that have really influenced my, my view here are saying, no, no, we're not going to the stars. Mm-hmm. We've peaked. We've had, we actually peaked some time ago. And at this point, we're elaborating certain technologies, sure, but look at what the stand, what standards of living are doing. Look at what's going on in the world as everything step by step falls apart in the same way as all those civilizations in the past. That's what they're saying. They're saying it very clearly. They're explaining it in detail. They've got all the footnotes. Well, Toynbee has, Toynbee has whole volumes that are basically gargantuan footnotes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but they've got all the details. So what do we, it's all right there. And nobody wants to hear that because that means we don't get our tomorrow land future. We don't get to trample the stars in our seven parsec boots. You know? <laughs> So just, I guess, briefly, and I guess it differs from thinker to thinker, what does a, what does a, a civilizational cycle look like? I believe Spengler had seasons, right? Yes, yeah, sure. Spengler liked to use the, the seasonal cycle just as a, as a metaphor, okay? Mm-hmm. So you have the springtime, which, you know, is not a – this is this is a German springtime, okay? It's gray, it's wet, it's rainy, it's cold, and you slog through mud a lot. <laughs> um, it's a period – it is an age of faith. It is an era of um, generally rural society. The core of society is, is, you know, basically scattered farms and little villages all over the place with a few cities scattered here and there. Um, the, the basic social form is feudalism. Um, the basic religious form is, is, is a predominant, overwhelmingly um, believed in religious faith that gives everyone their basic context. That's springtime. 
summertime comes, we get um, the birth of rationalism, we get the rise of cities, feudalism gives way to uh, typically to some kind of um, monarchical system. And uh, you have um, you have um, the, the birth of new art forms. You have scholarship taking the lead. You have various new ventures in the sciences and technologies. That's the summer. Okay, autumn, the monarchy fades out into bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. And you end up with, at this point, the rationalist, the, the rationalism um, petrifies. It becomes dogmatic. It fossilizes into bureaucratic forms. Um, the economies, the economy begins to falter. It's the harvest time, culturally speaking. You have enormous, uh, you know, developments in literature, in the arts, in knowledge about the world. Great classics are written, but everything's falling away bit by bit underneath. And in particular, the rural economy that, that's the foundation of the whole thing is steadily failing. Mm-hmm. If, you know, it, it, there's often some um, some topsoil loss and other problems like that involved, but one way or another, the whole thing's winding down. Then you get into winter as things simply come apart. And, um, you know, there, there's no longer enough of an economy to hold the society together. It breaks apart. You plunge into a dark age. Out of that dark age, a new springtime emerges. So that's the cycle. Um, it's very straightforward. You, can, if you, you know, pick up a book of history from any past civilization, you will see it sketched out in fine detail. And uh, it's purely our um, our fond delusion of being destiny's darlings. You know, the, the, the only people who really understand the universe <clears throat> that we're stuck in this, in, this, in this false belief that it doesn't apply to us. Go ahead. Where are we in the cycle? Um, we're, we're on the um, autumn on the edge of winter. Autumn on the edge. That's not too bad. Um, well, yeah, basically, we've we've been through the bureaucratization. We've seen the replacement of monarchies with um, vast, sprawling bureaucracies. Our, you know, our rural areas are increasingly impoverished and increasingly abandoned by anybody with, you know, anybody who's interested. Our cities have become hugely overblown. We've had, you know, the um hundred years of extraordinary artistic and literary and creative features, and now we're heading into a dark age. Now um, we've reached the point in, in Western in the Western um, societies, Europe and the European diaspora, that the foundations for civilized life are breaking apart, and down we go. Whee! <laughs> so uh, you know, many many times you, you've and you've written books commenting on what a you know a dark age, uh, a mm-hmm. collapse collapsing or collapsed society will look like, and given many uh, practical tips as well in collapse now and avoid mm-hmm. the rush most famously. Famously, but I want to bring in you know the other side of your work, the spiritual side to your work, mm-hmm. um, with a quote from one of your most recent pieces of writing, Science's Enchantment, where you say. Just as politics is downstream from culture, culture is downstream from imagination, and imagination mm-hmm. is downstream from the states of consciousness that give imagination its context. Mm-hmm. Those states mm-hmm. of consciousness change over time, and the change isn't oh, yes. necessarily one way. So instead mm-hmm. of saying what will, uh, I guess, what will collapse look like, because I think empirically, look out of your windows, in, well, if you have eyes to see. <laughs> but um, yes. what does what does what does the modern Western consciousness look like right now? Um, a mess. <laughs> it it resembles nothing so much as the streetscape. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back here and talk mm-hmm. about the cycle of consciousness mm-hmm. because that's also very important. This is something that Giambattista Jump, Vico, who doesn't get a lot of discussion these days, mm-hmm. talked about in great detail. Um, a a civilization or a culture, a society starts out in a state. The state of collapse that is as much internal as external. The the certainties of the previous age have been refuted by events, and it's ba- it's all the way down to what what Vico called the barbarism of sense. All you can be sure of is what you actually perceive yourself. Mm-hmm. All of the the reason, all of the philosophy and the law and the intricate constructions of consciousness that you get in a late civilization, all that has been swept away. And so from that, putting things together, developing the, the metaphors, because we always think in metaphors, of course, mm-hmm. developing the metaphors that, that make sense of the world, religion becomes the touchstone. And so you have in the springtime and going on into the summer, you have this tendency to focus on, on religious metaphors. 
That's why it's an age of faith. Mm-hmm. Everything's personalized. Everything is anthropomorphized. Um, you know, the, the, the rain and the wind have names and, and you can talk to them. And so gradually, the barbarism of sense gives way to the development of abstractions, a more abstract, um, less personal, less anthropomorphic way of thinking about things evolves. And it's different in every civilization. But you know, ours, ours took place originally by way of scholastic philosophy, and then that morphed into, into science. Um, the religion gradually gets ditched. Um, what that means is that um, the religious ideology gets taken and all the serial numbers are, are, are filed off it and um, some abstraction or other gets put in place of its deities. And so you end up with this secular structure that becomes more and more abstract, more and more complicated, more and more intricate, and more and more detached from reality. That's where we are now. We have a situation where most people are thinking in terms of vague, general abstractions that they think of are more real than the things they actually encounter. You see this in the political sphere all the time. Um, you know, people are, you know, any of the wars that are going on right now, for example, it's all um, side A, they're the good people, and here are the abstract reasons why they're the good people. Side B, they're the bad people, and here are the abstract reasons why they're the bad people. It has nothing to do with what's actually going on on the battlefield. But no, what's going on in the, in the two sides? It's purely a matter of we're assigning a set of abstractions to these and reality is supposed to, play, supposed to follow suit. Uh, Ukraine is a great example. Um, right now we have, you know, the, the, the Russians were loaded with the abstractions in the Western press of being the bad guys. That means they have to be incompetent. They have to be inadequately, you know, inadequately supplied and, because they're the bad guys and their job is to lose, Right. Mm-hmm. Except the, somebody forgot to tell Vladimir Putin that. <clears throat> of course, from the Russians' point of view, they're the, they're the good guys. And the Ukrainians are the Nazis. They're replaying the Second World War. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't get into the times. That doesn't get into, it doesn't even get into the daily fail. Um, so what, what you have here is a situation where um, people are so caught up in their in, in these abstract ideas, these abstract notions about how the world ought to be, do they lose track of what's actually going on? Mm. Of course, the whole business of progress is, is, the, is the supreme example in our time. People are convinced we're going to the stars. Here are these marvelous inventions that surely will revolutionize our lives, and we're not going to talk about the last three dozen that failed to do so. Um, we'll have flying cars any day now. Don't notice the fact the first flying car uh, was took off in 1917. It was a dud, and so has every other, so has every other flying car uh, been. And so, you know, but it's still stuck on those abstractions. So we're in this situation where our heads, where by and large, in the Western world, people's heads are full of these totally irrelevant, abstract views on the world that get in the way of their dealing with what's actually happening in society. That, in turn, is one of the major factors that drives the coming of the Dark Age because the abstractions collapse. It becomes just too much of a burden to keep on believing in progress mm. when everything's falling apart around you. Has anything ever persevered throughout the um, Oh, lots of things. I mean, human nature is what it is. Um, there's a lot of stuff that survives. I mean, we have, for example, literary works dating back um, many, many cycles. You can pick up a copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh mm-hmm. if you want. That's been around for a while. So there are literary deve- there are there are creative works that last. There are intellectual achievements that last. We still have logic. The Greeks invented that. Um, you know, and there are various other things that become part of the sort of continuing knowledge base. But one of the things that happens during the during the Dark Age, during the last part of autumn, actually, and into winter, is a sorting through of what of what has been produced by the previous civilization. And people are basically picking over the ruins and saying, "Wow, well, okay, this is worth saving. That, not so much." Which is how logic got to us, for example. Um, a lot of people in various parts of the world picked up Greek logic, said, wow, I could use this, and walked off with it. Do you think anything of um, our era, let's say, going back, uh, let's say going back 100 years, just, just for oh, the yeah. sake of it, do you think, do you think anything uh, distinctly from our, the last 100 years, one, if you were to travel forward 1,000 years, you might see? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I expect I, I expect um, some literary works to survive. It would amaze me, for example, if the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, become one of those enduring classics. Mm-hmm. Um, so there will be some literary works. Those are easy to easy to pass on, easy to transmit into the future. Um, it would. Not surprise me at all. I mean, most of our artworks will be gone, but some things will survive from that. In terms of ideas, um, well, the, the the great age of Western philosophy ended by about by about 1850. <laughs> so it's unlikely that any of our philosophical thought is going to make it. It will, if if copies survive, they will be treated the way that like late Roman philosophy is treated, as kind of products of decadence, something that that what was going on after all the really interesting thinkers died. Um, Will some, you know, some of our technologies possibly only the simple ones though. Um, one thing that I expect to survive, however, is um, organic organic agriculture. Mm-hmm. One of the great achievements of the 20th century was the development of in the Western world of systems of agriculture that are sustainable over the long term. Those are likely to survive simply because people who take them up are likely to get by much better than people who don't once we no longer have fertilizers and fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. So there will be there will be heritage. There will be a range of things passed on. Some of them will be incredibly stupid. <laughs> I mean, there there are things there are things from Roman times, bits of bits of artwork. I'm thinking of the very famous um sculpture I don't recall at the moment where it was found somewhere in Italy, which is um Pan having an intimate relationship with an anti goat. Hmm. <laughs> it's a beautiful bronze sculpture. You know, he's gazing lovingly into her eyes. She's gazing, gazing lovingly into his. Will they do the thing? Mm-hmm. And you know, there it is. <laughs> so I mean, so there's, there's often this. Um, that's often used as a fictional device. I mean, it's used well in uh, Canticle for Leibovitz, right? This, mm-hmm. this notion of digging up stuff from the past and then oh, yeah. uh, you could say extrapolating an incorrect reading. Of mm-hmm. what those people were like. I mean, if, oh, yeah. if for instance people were to dig up a few of our common knickknacks and things we use, I mean, what do you think uh, future generations would think of our of us? Well, the, we would have to know what their what their society valued and what their society mm-hmm. thought of of the past. I mean, you know, the, most our our archaeologists are constantly going. I don't know what that is. It must be religious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what our archaeologists do, and it, it lands them an enormous amount of stupidity. Um, I I happen to know some people who, for example, are, are spinners. They use drop spindles, and they will tear their hair out over the number of archaeologists who say, well, here's this, this pierced disc that has some curious wear patterns. It must be a religious artifact. It's a spindle whorl. <laughs> But but you know you can't tell that to the archaeologists because they're the experts. Doubtless, some similar thing will go on. Okay. You know, a thousand years from now, people will be digging up the realm, the, the ruins of the ancient Americans. You know, okay, here we've we've actually you know we sent an expedition through the western deserts to the long abandoned ruins of Las Vegas. <laughs> okay, and this must have been a center of religious pilgrimage. People came here to make offerings. Well, that's not entirely oh, wrong. Head. That's not entirely wrong, though, is it? It's not entirely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but they must have worshipped a fertility goddess. <laughs> yeah, all these all these poles everywhere. Um, yeah, the, yeah, these these poles they're phallic, they're phallic symbols, you understand. And uh, we, sacred priestesses did sacred dances, you know, something like that. I mean, just to just to stay on that, I guess, in a way, this notion of the idea that you know. Uh, the sense of secular worship. I mean, this is. I know you're you're very fond of um, Joseph and Storm's um, the myth of disenchantment, and mm-hmm. um, you know, I have I have maybe not so much a disagreement as just a place of discussion. I guess is you know mm-hmm. the the idea of the myth of progress, or maybe you can say in relation to Las Vegas, both progress and the myth of like you know being a billionaire or whatever, or getting rich quick. Mm-hmm. Do you do you see the belief in progress? As quite literally the same as say the belief in um, I don't know pick, you know pick a pick a god or a goddess from from antiquity. I mean, do you, are these two forms of quote unquote worship or belief the same? They're, no, they're not quite the same. Um, this is actually something I discussed at some length in my book After Progress. Um, the thing the, there is a difference between a secular religion or a secular yeah a secular religion and a theological religion. Okay, um, we have a couple of good examples of secular religion. Um, the faith in progress is one. Marxism is another. Mm. They basically take over the metaphors of the earlier um, theological religion, 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, but apply those meta, those metaphors to a to a salvation and a and a narrative, a, a historic narrative that only that exists entirely in, um, in in the world of everyday life. So that instead of the second coming of Jesus, you have the revolution of the proletariat. Okay. Um, or what have you. Um, so, but it's, it's not, it's not quite the same. A secular faith has a different, you know, it has, it has different emphases. It has, it has different expressions. It rarely actually has formal temples. At most, you might have a few shrines like, you know, like Lenin's tomb, but it doesn't actually have the, 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 you know, the temples, the, the, the formal priesthood, this kind of stuff. It simply, it, it goes on in a slightly less informal way. It simply fills the same ideological need in people's minds to have a narrative that makes sense of, the, of their world and that, 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 that glorifies them in some way. It, it, I mean, it seems to, uh, to, to fill that void in the mind. I mean, mm-hmm. going back to Las Vegas, that, you know, I know plenty of people who would say, say, older friends who would say, oh, at some point I'd love to go there, which sounds, you know, almost like someone, a Catholic saying, oh, at some point I'd love to go to Lourdes. You know, it's this, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. this far off pilgrimage that needs to be. But there's a difference it's, that, that yes. it, it fills, but it doesn't fulfill. So why exactly. why is that? Because it's not real? Because well, like you've been saying, it's actually not. It's all abstraction. Once it's, it's all, well, partially it's all abstraction. Partially, um, I will be I, I will be unpopular here and suggest that human beings really do have something that we could call a religious instinct, a, a an orientation toward the unseen, toward the spirit, toward what we call the spiritual realm, and that that's not that's not just an artifact of society. That's something that's as, as essential to us as sex or as hunger, mm-hmm. and so. The secular faiths, such as the faith in progress, such as Marxism and so on, um, they're kind of ersatz equivalents. There's a pretense of fulfilling that religious need, but they don't connect to anything transcendent. They don't, they don't reach into the unseen. They don't actually, you know, answer the, 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 the simple but essential question, okay, when I die, what next? Uh, or any of the other things that religions do. And so, I think one of the reasons they don't get the temples, the you know, the and all the other um, paraphernalia of of um, actual theological religions, is they don't really meet the need. Mm-hmm. By the way, I've been to Las Vegas twice. Yeah. I thought it was a pretty fierce simulacrum of hell. It was a horrible place. Well, it is. It is uh, <laughs> it just, no, no, not even, it's, the th- the thing is actually it's the one place that really made me understand the Christ- the Christian concept of sin. Which normally has just left me going, what? Um, we, I was uh, both times I was attending a, a conference on alchemy. Now talk about ironies, okay? But so I was at this alchemy conference, and we were we were in this second rate um, casino hotel, and we, you know, the the conference had the meeting rooms, and, and you know, we had we had a big block of rooms for everybody, but there was also the casino going on downstairs. You to get from the the hotel rooms to the meeting rooms, you had to go through the casino. And to get food in the place, you had to go into the casino because that's where all the restaurants were. And it was this nightmarish kind of thing where there were all these people caught up in a trance of frustrated craving, mm-hmm. bending over the, the the slot machines or bending over the tables and just radiating this aura of greed and fake hope and mm-hmm. craving and misery and despair. It was hideous. <laughs> why? Well, uh, I guess, yeah, we could stay on that. I mean, why Why do you think so many people end up there? Um, because it's be, because it's the closest thing our society offers to a religious pilgrimage. Yeah. Because it feeds into the dream that maybe you can be a millionaire. Maybe you can be one of those that, you know, stride forth to the cutting edge of the grand march of humanity, blah, blah, blah. Um, people are easy to bamboozle. Mm. That's one of the things you can you can count on in our species. People will believe what they want to believe. They'll believe what they're taught, even when it's nonsense. Um, I mean, people bought into Marxism for how long? People buy into the belief in progress right now, even though we've been clearly regressing for about 50 years. Um, people are easy to bamboozle. So they keep on going back because, you know, it's it, gambling is addictive for a lot of people. Yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, to draw this into the, the notion of cycles of consciousness as well, and your quote from Scientist's mm-hmm. Enchantment, I've been reading a book recently um, called Catafalque by Peter Kingsley, which is... Um, mm-hmm. uh, his, I'm familiar uh, with King. I'm yeah. familiar with Kingsley. I haven't read I haven't read Catafalque yet. Uh, it's it's great, but one one short excerpt that I was reading last night that stood out to me in relation to this uh, Las Vegas al- alchemical anecdote of your own is that he differentiates um, individualism and individuation, so Jungian individuation. Of, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, take any esoteric current as well, and you'll find some mm-hmm. form of mm-hmm. true mm-hmm. will or whatever you want to call it, but mm-hmm. individuation. But it's interesting that he says that... Uh, for Jung, it was a luciferic energy for individualism. You know, for this, mm-hmm. I choose. You know, I choose this box of cereal to be my breakfast cereal. I choose this um, brand jumper for mine. I choose this casino. <coughs> right. This is all these uh, mm-hmm. so-called empirical choices which bolster the false ego, and mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. individual. And uh, you know, this cycle of consciousness does it head? Uh, does it? Uh, shall we say? homogenize, like more so homogenize that form of individualism and really block off, really occlude possibilities and avenues of individuation. Because, I mean, one one of the errors I can't really get out of my own mind is that the modern world, okay, you, <laughs> the modern world is no different in terms of cycles, but it does seem to be different in its negatives in that in terms no. of history, it seems mm-hmm. to be one of the worst times to live for things that get in your way of that possibility, or, or, or have well, we always really not cared all this much? Well, no, it's it, this again. This this is actually this is actually part of the cycle. Hmm. Um, one of the things one of the things I wrote about um, earlier this year. Um, oh, come on, I'm going to lose the name of the book now. Um, the Satyricon by um, Petronius Arbiter. Hmm. Okay, it's a late Roman novel. Mm-hmm. We we have only a portion of it. Um, it's a work we would now call it a work of pornography. There's a lot of sex in it, and it is just as alienated from um, from individuation, from spirituality, as you know any modern you know cheap um, you know Hollywood sex and and what have you thriller. Mm-hmm. On the, you know, in, for sale in, in, in supermarkets today. It's the same stuff. We are in a period, we, we happen to be living in a period right now where, um, the, he, the piling up of abstractions, the heaping up of, of arbitrary beliefs, the detachment from the realities of the human condition is at its maximum. And so, yes, right now, and you know, for a century, more than a century before, and for some time to come, there's there's going to be that barrier in place. But there was that barrier in place in Roman times too. There was that barrier in place in other times. That's it's normal. Now, you know, it's that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean we should just go, oh well, no big deal. You know, it's it's something to, it's something we have to struggle with. You know, those, so those who were born you, in this you period. Think how. Uh... That's, you know the technologies we've developed have made it uh, have accelerated the, those barriers have made them uh, in a sense of actual no. quality worse. No, I don't. I don't. I don't actually think so. I think that people again, people in the Roman Colosseum watching watching gladiators slaughter themselves right in front of them were just as deta- they were just as caught up in the spectacle, just as detached from the spirit as anybody else. Or going to the going to the pantomime where you have you know um, pe- you know lots of naked flesh and things like that. Um, it was that we we do the same we do this with technology, mm. but what we're doing is actually not that different. It's like it's like military affairs. Mm. Um, if you look back in in the history of Babylonia, where they were dealing with the Kassites in the north, they had exactly the same problem that you, that, that you know that modern empires have had dealing with the fractious people, and you know, they they were dealing with a counterinsurgency situation. The weapons were different. The means of transport were different. The strategic problems were the same. Mm. In the same way, the specific technologies of distraction that we're using are different. Mm. But the level of distraction, again, read it, read the Satyricon. There's this great moment where one of the one of one of the guests at this appalling banquet, Tremelchio, is a is is very nouveauish and very crass, and he's throwing this big banquet at which our, our, our protagonist is attending. And one of the old guys there is going on about how nobody believes in the gods anymore and doing just this exactly canned. Um, you've heard this same speech 
a dozen times, in, you know, from from old from old people here and now. Hmm. And so, it's the same consciousness, the same the same sense of distance from the spiritual immersion in the abstract, immersion in a cloud of of mental chatter. So no, you know, nothing new under the sun. But um, mm -hmm. I would also, you know, um, a lot of people. They do this classic thing, uh, just in relation mm -hmm. to this fact that nothing's really changing, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. or you know, oh. different technology, same, same, uh, you know, abstract thing being undertaken. Yeah. Let's say um, a lot of people do this thing where they, you know, it's a, it's an element of the myth of progress, most definitely, uh, where they anything back in time, and you say, well, we could do that, and they'll say, oh, do you do you want to? The classic one is, oh, you want to live back then? Do you want to get typhoid? Right, and they. <laughs> They conflate history with the like oh, yeah. the you know the empirical illness which would have happened at the time. But what's interesting, more interesting about that is actually if you look at the the data that we have at least of the longevity of people, mm -hmm. is that sure statistically you can read it and say oh so, many, so x amount of people died before they were thirty, but then okay that that is um you know that is completely true. I'm not going to deny that. But then when you look at another piece of data, which is that um if people do survive after thirty, they're they're Median life expectancy is still around 75, 80, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this mm -hmm. notion of like, oh, you know, if you were in Victorian Britain, it would have been the worst thing ever. You'd have been, you know, typhoid from birth and you'd have, you know, everyone, like this notion that everyone was sick and dying. Well, how did mm -hmm. we get here if that was the truth? Mm -hmm. um, well, sorry, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go well, ahead. All, all I was going to say is, that, you know, one, one of the very difficult pills to swallow i think of the modern world where we put such an emphasis you know one of the immediate defenses of the modern world is well what about modern medicine what about modern surgery mm -hmm. which to me mo the majority of modern medicine is the equivalent of a hammer and sickle to your you know first you first you have to take the you, you what, what's the saying you you take the antibiotics and then you have to take something else to recover from the antibiotics right um mm -hmm. um point being is that it doesn't really seem that we've gone you know, and I, I, I'll put my own skin in the game here because a lot of people say that's completely unequivocally just not true. But we really haven't moved that much further than the stereotype of the witch doctor to the modern doctor. Not that much has changed at all. You know, people aren't suddenly surviving into their 120s. People are still have chronic illnesses, which modern doctors cannot figure out. And they'll the way they figure them out is just to define them with a label. And that to them is like the equivalent of cure, and everyone else is just medicated into a sort of a, a strange haze. Um, I'll risk, I'll risk saying it, so other people okay. don't have to. But we just haven't moved that far at all, and I think it's well, I'm, our I'm, own I, uh, hubris that. that I, I'm I'm going to quibble very slightly, not with your conclusion, but with a couple <laughs> of the details. Okay, mm -hmm. we have actually accomplished something very important, which is actually becoming a major, has been a major problem, which is that. Um, Infant mortality has dropped very sharply since, and it was not, by the way, physicians who did this. It was the invention of modern sanitation. Once people mm -hmm. figured out that um, basically you have to make, make sure that water is clean. Mm -hmm. It was that simple. That's, that caused the, the steep drop in infant mortality, which also caused the extreme expansion of a world population. We're still adjusting to that, to the fact that, um, I mean, in the Victorian, in the Victorian era, yeah, if you made it past your fifth birthday, you were probably going to live to 70. Mm -hmm. Unless you were, unless you were, well, in the working class, in which case you also had to make it past, on the other hand, on the one hand, your first childbirth, on the other hand, the risk of military service, both of which killed a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but half the children could be ex half the infants could be expected to die mm. before their fifth birthday. That's changed. That's dramatic. Mm -hmm. Now it has negative aspects as well as positive ones, but it is a dramatic change. It was not done by doctors. It was done by in by engineers, people who enter you know a little bit of research and say, "Well, we can filter the <clears throat> fecal matter out of our water supply." What a concept! <laughs> And and then all of a sudden things changed. So that has happened. We also um, the the one other thing that our our health system is fairly good at is injury repair. Mm -hmm. We're fairly good at that. Other than that, <laughs> we had a brief window of in, of remarkable success caused by antibiotics. But nearly all the antibiotics now um, are no longer no longer that useful because the bacteria are evolving right around them. Mm -hmm. 
with 100 years of the outside, antibiotics are going to be a dead letter because, you know, life finds a way, including that finds a way to kill you. Uh, and so... Um, so basically, we did have we did have some remarkable achievements in this civilization. They're not enduring, no. and it's going to be really interesting to see if enough people remember enough of the details of, sanit of basic sanitation that um, you know things like clean water and and soap. <laughs> soap is revolutionary stuff. Um, if these two things remain common, then the world's going to slowly have to adjust to having more to having a lot more children survive. But um, but beyond that, in terms of extending life beyond the you know the the typical you know three score and ten, um, in terms of dealing with these chronic illnesses that are so pervasive, in dealing with all kinds of other problems, we're doing very poorly. And there's the far from minor point that right now medical treatment is the third is the number three cause of death. Wow. Yeah. What's the top um, two? Yeah, um, it's it. It has been this. This on the one hand, you have um, side effects, often fatal side effects of prescription drugs. You have um, the fact that nosocomial infections. The fact that hospitals these days are a great place to get infected with pathogens. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, there's a lot of surgery and other medical treatment that goes awry. There's a lot of simple malpractice. Um, there are all kinds of nasty things going on within the modern medical industry that kill people. And it is, you know, it's reached the point that, yeah, you know, you've got heart disease, you've got cancer, and then you have medical treatment mm -hmm. as the leading causes of death. So, you know, when we're talking about witch doctors, that's maybe the witch, you know, the witch doctors may may not have been able to do more than provide some some useful herbal medicine and make some very effective effective use of the placebo effect. But at least they weren't feed, feeding people drugs that would kill them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, one of this is this actually this is actually something that's come up in my, in my own in my own teaching because I one one of the things like many occultists I, I ended up learning from my teachers a variety of alternative healing methods and I'll occasionally deal with people who are going well you know that's not going to treat cancer or that's not going to do that and I'm saying yeah sure but it's also not going to give you you know these thirty four side effects that are caused by statins or what have you well yeah and I think. Um... You know, I think back. I, I I often think of trying to remember the guy, not Semmelweis, the other germ germ theory. You know, famous at the time there was a debate between ter germ theory and territory theory, right? This mm -hmm. notion of you know which one is which one mm -hmm. is really the controller. And on his deathbed, he said, you know, the uh, the germ is nothing, the territory is everything. And I think we're very much a, like a germ focused. Um, oh yeah, same yeah. way that people say we're a, we're a, we're a coping. We're a coping world and not a you mm -hmm. know a preparation world, and we we don't really pay pay too much heed to the yeah. territory. Um, yeah, and we, we no, wait till I, things go wrong and then try patch them up instead of and uh, it's thinking frantically scramble around trying to fix <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, the, the it it is it is a classic example of of why European culture has gotten itself to so many um, blind alleys that you have exactly this kind of debate between the germ theory and the territory theory. Of course, it's both. Mm -hmm. It's like back early in the history of geology, you had the, the struggle between the Neptunists and the Plutonists, and the Neptunists insisted that all rocks were laid down as sediment, and the Plutonists insisted, no, all rocks are exuded from the Earth as lava. Well, they were both part right. But for like a century, these two parties were yelling at each other and making and, and you know, standing square in the path of, of you know, learning about geology, because neither of them could say, okay, what if it's both? Why do we, why do, we a, why do we struggle for that? Uh, you know, this, I, I, I lucked out because mm -hmm. I used to want my tutor in college. He always used to say, "The truth is gray." That was his thing, mm -hmm. which I thought mm -hmm. was a great, great quote. But why, so why it's, do we struggle with that grayness? Um, ultimately, I think it's a function of the religious origins of Western culture. We have this belief um, from that we've inherited from Christianity. That there is one true doctrine. And then there are all of these other false doctrines. And if you get the true doctrine, you go to heaven. And if you get, if you believe the false doctrine, then you get the divine boot in the face forever. Um, and that, you know, that, that was central to the religious modality that around which our society, our, our civilization came into being. And as religion was replaced by secular ideologies, all the secular ideologies grabbed the same thing. No, this is the one true statement about everything. Mm -hmm. 
And so they're all basically trying to be little scientific popes <laughs> and claim, you know, claim infallibility as they thunder their ex cathedra pronouncements. <laughs> So and this is this is the thing that Spengler said. You know, every 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 secular the secular ideology of each society is its religion, with you know with all the theological elements quietly uh, covered up. I mean, this 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 brings me to a, I guess to a further question because I think it probably would be related. You know, we're talking, mm -hmm. we were talking about cycles earlier, and so this notion of the seasons. It it reminded me of a, a quote by Uspensky during World War One, where mm -hmm. he, he um, he's walking along and suddenly, in preparation for World War One, he sees a um, a truck full of, and this is his quote. He says, "Crutches for legs yet blown off," which I think mm -hmm. is fantastic for the sort of determinism yeah. of cycles. But it mm -hmm. it brings about the question of why why does no, why do people not get together? Why do people not have the forethought to stop and say, you know what, maybe if we did this, this, and this, we're not going to have this huge peak and, and we can have a bit of steady state. Why are we so averse to just slowing down and making sensible decisions? Well, the thing is, I think the, the problem is we do make sensible decisions. Yeah. We look at, this, you know, um, in, in, in 14th century England, People were saying, okay, you know, we can, we, you know, we, we've got through the Black Death. We can now start doing a little more with cities. We've got water power. There's this neat new kind of water wheel. We can actually make things more prosperous. And then in the 18th century, there's steam power. And it, it makes perfect sense because there's this, this, an infinite amount of coal. And basically at each point people are facing the situation doing the reasonable thing they're doing the thoughtful thing they don't happen to step back to an olympian view and see you know a thousand years down the line what this is going to result how can they and if they did they'd be sufficiently rare that the other 2000 people who have the same idea you know will just walk right on past them and build the water wheel or the steam or the steam engine or whatever so it's it, the the whole the cycle is driven by people making reasonable decisions, making the best decisions available to them at the time. That is, I suppose, you could say the tragedy of history. But at the same time, it's important not to think of. I mean, we we have this notion in the Western world that death is bad. Mm. You know that we shouldn't get old. I forget which tech, which um, you know Silicon Valley tech bro is prancing around right now, trying to live forever. Um, Brian, Brian Johnson. Yeah, getting getting plasma transfusions from his own son. Yeah. I mean, vampirism by by another name. Uh, I think I think just in terms of if something if I want something to survive through mm -hmm. to thousand two thousand years, he has these shirts for sale that simply say "Don't die," and I think <laughs> one of them. Mm -hmm. Ends up two thousand. There's something in that that I I don't know. It's str strangely poignant. But it's yeah. it's it's very poignant. I hope I hope he is buried in one of those. And so many so many people would uh, see that as maybe like a cruel statement. We just I mean so I had this I had this uh, an interview with um, uh, Troya who wrote a book um, called Technologies of the Human Corpse, which is about trying to erase the myth that we're scared of death and his argument was that you know what would you rather talk about your your death or how much money you have in your bank account which you know <laughs> maybe maybe that works i don't know if it works but i i still think i don't think it's a fear i don't think we have a fear it's just a complete uh erasure i think i you know i've said this to you before but but um as you're saying there's a certain projection that's come from somewhere where death night darkness skeletons mm -hmm. skulls mm -hmm. These are all bad, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I wonder where this has come from. Because this is so unhelpful. Oh, it's it, well, well, uh, he, no. Here, here, I see. This is this is especially a Western thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in some cultures that have have a significant Western presence, um, in Mexico, for example, um, the the Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead, is a sub, it's a celebration, mm -hmm. and you know, skulls and skeletons are not are not. Spooky. That's just part of life. That's why you know Santísima Muerte, the, the you know most holy death, is is a folk goddess with an extremely large and growing following these days. There's the, the you you can see the sort of stirring of the old Aztec consciousness, this comfort with death. Very common in many societies. We ha we got into it. I think partly there's that hardcore dualism from Christianity, and then there is the terror of hell. 
because our you know the the Chris, Christianity generally the Abrahamic religions in their in their most recent cycle obsessed about the idea that if you are not one of the good people you are going to be tortured forever um, by by you know by God in a bad mood and that's that left very deep wounds mm-hmm. in our society that 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 obsession with the thought of death as infinite torment. And I think one of the reasons we have had such a flight to into atheism over the last couple of hundred years in the Western world is people who are frantically trying to say, no, I'm not going to fry for all eternity. I'm just going to stop being. But there's still that terror. There's still that, you know, the fear that as soon as you die, the devil is going to sink his claws into you and God is going to laugh in your face. Mm. <laughs> and so, but, I, but I think that... ties into the notion of that sort of tribalist... Full stop, yeah. right? Like this side, and then it then it ends. Whereas it I guess ends. you would see that uh, you know death is just a change in a way. Does, does it, morbid does it just a, sound to Westerners? Death is just we death, death, death is <laughs> death is just a change. Exactly. We are always we are always in the middle of dying. <laughs> you know, it is, we are always going through these transformations, and um, you know, we are technically speaking, we're not the same person entirely that we were yesterday. And so there's, you know, we, 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 we sleep and we awake, we go through our own, you know, our own small scale death every single night. And, but we've made that a source of absolute terror. And there's all that, you know, the darkness and the skeletons and all, all this radical dualism that pervades our society. these days. It's also this obsession with binary divisions where every spectrum has to be divided into two far ends with nothing in between. Um, it's all part of the same cultural phenomenon. And I think it played a large role in, in our achievements as a civilization and it is playing a large role in our failures and our ultimate destruction. Were you ever afraid of death? Um, when I was a child, I was a little worried about it. I was going, okay, um, you know, if, if the, way I, the way I thought about it um, when I got a little older, I couldn't come up with a metaphor. If you were, sudden, if you were to be told that tomorrow, Somebody's going to come and grab you and haul us and you know put you into a tr- into a, a bus and drive off, and you have no way of knowing where it's going. Would you be scared? Yeah, probably. Yes, you know most people find would find that a very unnerving prospect, even if you were going someplace really nice because you don't know. It's just to- a total a total crap shoot. Um, then, of course, I was I wasn't raised within Christianity. I mean, I, I was, I was, my, I grew up in one of the, one of the least religious parts of the United States, um, the Pacific Northwest. There was like one family in our neighborhood that was religious, and everyone thought they were weird. Um, so, the thought, you know, we, over the course of of my of my teen years, I, you know, I did a lot of reading and explored a number of things. I read quite a bit about the evidence for things like reincarnation and so on. And came and you know gradually got to the came to the conclusion that okay it's not that big a deal because I have some idea of what to expect. Mm. And then you know getting involved, getting seriously involved in occult philosophy, and also you know having <clears throat> having a, some apparent past life memory surface. It was um, that that was very that's very reassuring. When you, okay, I've been been here, done this. <laughs> okay, it's not a problem. So you know at that point it stopped being anything to worry about. What's it going to be like for people who just completely aren't prepared, who actually probably uh, do maybe believe on some level that they're going to be here forever? Yeah, exactly. No, it's going to be a shock to them. But <clears throat> I think I think as they you know as they go through the process and realize that they still exist, a lot of them are going to go, oh wow, okay. <laughs> so I so I didn't need to be that terrified. Of course, depending on what they've done, there there are issues of karma and things like that. The process of of the the process of going through the afterlife, according to a cult tradition, involves a certain amount of reliving your life um, in an objective light, where you can see exactly you know you don't get to portray it to yourself as you want it to be. You get to see what it, what you actually did, mm. and that's heaven or that's hell. Mm. But you know we can. But that's you know that's for those people who who take occult teaching seriously or who have reason to do so. And I'm not going to try to insist that, that my entire audience, our entire audience, just now ought to just take that on faith. Faith is the last thing we need here. A certain amount of open mindedness will do much more. Which, which, just out of interest, which occult teachings would that be? Um, well, almost anything in classic occultism. 
um, whether you're looking at the Theosophists, the Anthroposophists, some of the Rosicrucian material that I've studied, Druid traditions, and so on, uh, re- you find reincarnation is the standard teaching in all of them, and all of them you know, draw on the same kind of evidence that was studied by the various um, psychic, psychical science researchers back in the day, and then, of course, um, who is it? David, Dr. David Stevenson, who published whole volumes of evidence for reincarnation. Um, yeah, if, if if you get into if you get into any 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 Western occultism between about 1850 and about 1970, you'll you'll run across a very much the same teaching. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just fly off on a completely different tangent here that is Good. related to our conversation, however, but because it's something people have pestered me about this, and I really want to know his his, his thoughts on this. So you know, I, I think it's probably some version of the like the savior myth once again. But AI, right? This is why everything's so transparent these days is that AI is the big thing, right? It's the new thing that's going to save everything. Um, I don't have too much to say about it because, like, I've played around with the AI that we currently have and it's really awful and just ruining everything. Um, but what are, what just generally, I guess, generally speaking, what are your thoughts? I mean, what is, what is this phenomena as well? What's the root of this? I have lived through... I, I I would have to sit down and count how many. Here's the next wonderful thing that will save us all: technology. Mm-hmm. Okay, it never does. Computers were going to do this, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and personal computers especially. Once we got computers into everyone, that was going to just transform the world and make it all wonderful. Again, look out the window. Um, AI. The, the the assumption that I hear from the AI types is that. You know, the only thing that's keeping us from having the the imaginary Tomorrowland utopia of our dreams is that we don't know how to do it. It can't possibly be that it's not an option. It can't possibly be that there are real limits. And you know, if the, let's say they did get some kind of super intelligent supercomputer, most of the laws of nature can be phrased fairly clearly as, "Um, you can't do that." Mm-hmm. Think of the laws. Think of the conservation laws, and so on. And so, our super intelligent supercomputer, you know, spends a few weeks understanding the entire the entire universe, and says, "Well, sorry, but you can't have that. Mm-hmm. There's no physical way for you to, you know, to get the amount of energy and the amount of resources you need when you've already wasted so much. Sorry." <laughs> um, the, the mere, yeah. Well, actually, actually, I I, I published a story um, which. Kind of, kind of was along those lines. It's a um, complicated story. Um, Grist Magazine did this contest where they wanted um, woke future stories full of hope and joy and this kind of stuff. They're horrible. I mean, one of their one of their winning ones had had humanity being saved by learning how to use different pronouns. It was that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and. Um, so I actually actually was involved in in a counter contest which put together a, another collection of stories which are titled uh, "The Flesh of Your Future Sticks Between My Teeth." We, we were feeling those of us who put it together were feeling in a kind of raffish mood, and my um, my my interest had my my entry for this was um, a story in which super intelligent AI um, computers figured out the way to to, to um, save the world was to get all of these. You know, managerial class people who use all these resources and uh, talk endlessly about how everyone else has to cut back and like off them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, because the, the the notion is again, it's, the, it's theology. These mm-hmm. people think that AIs are not only gods, but gods that are their pets, where they can just pat them on the head and say, "Okay, now give us everything we want," and all of a sudden the goodies start pouring out. It has never occurred to them that maybe there are real limits. It has never occurred to them that maybe we've wasted our, our chance. That maybe even a super intelligent AI could do no more than say, "Well, actually, you know, Oswald Spengler was right." And guess what? Deal. Yeah. I think the thing with this as well is that even with all these technologies, I mean, computers are a good example, and then handheld computers, and then remote mm-hmm. work, and all this. It's much like people who go traveling to find themselves. They don't realize they've taken themselves with them. Mm-hmm. Um, in the, even after all these great technologies, we're still stuck with ourselves. And no one's, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, I certainly yeah. have it, but no one's becoming individuated to go back to what we were talking about earlier. You yeah. know, the, these don't change anything of the quality. And so 
it's still a bunch of fairly ignorant mm -hmm. apes yeah. doing stuff. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Trying to, you know, the, a bunch of ignorant apes dancing around a wooden pole they've splashed with colored mud, insisting that the juju in the pole is going to give them all kinds of goodies. Mm. Except we call, we call the, the pole splashed with mud AI now. And... Um, I, I and this is something I expect to go on certainly through the end of my life, probably for another for another century or more before winter really sets in and um, the industrial the, the the entire worldview of industrial society collapses and we end up back in that barbarism of sense. Um, is this conviction since you know religion did not come up with a savior who would show up on time? And save us from the consequences of our own mistakes. That, very, that of course, technology, our substitute religion, has to come up with that savior. I mean, you, you see this. You see this in kind of in bold relief with the the transhumanists and the um, oh come on the the singular singularitarian people who literally. Their entire belief is Protestant fundamentalist Christianity and science fiction drag. For Jesus, replace superintelligent computers. For the second coming, read the singularity. For the glorified bodies that are like the robot bodies into which we'll all be uploaded. For, you know, and you just, it's, it's, you know, computer geek fundamentalist, fundamentalist Protestantism. Hmm. And yet, if you tell them that, you will get this blank look. You know, the, the like like cows watching a passing train. <laughs> so, I mean, just in relation to our whole conversation about you know collapse and cycles, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. I mean, the first mm -hmm. one being, um, has anything of your own lifetime surprised you that you might consider? Oh, I really wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, yes, actually, there there have been several of those, and most of them have been great disappointments. <laughs> um, yeah. In at the end of the 1970s, the early 1980s, I did not expect the appropriate technology movement. All these people who seemed to be gearing up to deal with the consequences of our ecological predicament and actually move toward a sustainable society to crumple, mm. to run like scared rabbits into the arms of Ronald Reagan. And they did. It was one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. People who were, you know, loudly talking about how important the earth is and they turn on a dime and all of a sudden they're, you know, be investing in stock and, and voting and you know, voting for money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we had a second version of that again at the end of the peak oil movement when it became very clear that if you wanted to talk about climate change and only climate change, there was funding to be had. There was publicity. There were all these things. But you had to stop talking about peak oil. Mm. And you'd be amazed how many people you know, chicken, chickened out and knuckled under. Um, and you know, the whole peak oil movement popped like a balloon. And I have watched an enormous number of people who I, of whom I, I had uh, fairly high opinions abandon their, um, ab abandon their apparent ideals at the drop of a hat. Mm. Um, I mean, to, to touch on a topic that I think is perhaps um, even edgier, the number of people who responded to the whole coronavirus business, people who were into alternative health care, people who were into being skeptical of corporations and, and, and doubting the health care industry, all of a sudden, no, 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 we must have total faith in what the, the, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry tells us, and no, 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 we can't use anything alternative. We have to just go line up and get the shot. It was bizarre. Mm. And it left me with, you know, the, those experiences and others like them left me with a far more cynical attitude toward humanity than I wish I, than I, wish I had. You know, I wish we were something like our fantasies, but, you know, yeah, apes capering mm. around a pole. One thing, one thing, just you know, use the word cynical. I've been, and it's just something I've been thinking about recently because I'm fairly pessimistic and cynical myself. Um, mm -hmm. Is that you know, if you trace that back, you're looking really at the the father of cynicism, which is Diogenes and his back. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because his point with cynicism was that to, it was to you know um, deride the virtues and principles of the society that surrounded him. It was a way of mm -hmm. living to you know throw that in everyone's faces but it makes me wonder if you can even be cynical today because we don't really have any principles or um, <laughs> values that anyone holds sincerely so mm -hmm. how can you actually be cynical today you know what could you actually do that would truly <laughs> rile someone up i mean i guess 
questioning progress, right? Is the thing. Oh yes, you can pre- you can question progress. You can question the coronavirus vaccines. Those who did that riled up an enormous number of people. Um, you can question whatever the obsession du jour is. I you know when I when I started writing about um, the war in Ukraine, for example, and did not simply do it in the sort of caricatured good guy versus bad guy. Um, I had people ranting in various forums about how I had the wrong opinions about Ukraine, you know, openly. You can definitely, all you have to do is break with the group think, and you can get people in a tizzy fit. So cynicism is still an option. You'll be pleased to know. Um, I I thought Diogenes, the, the the thing about Diogenes that I was like the best, it's not living in the barrel and this kind of stuff or the business with Alexander the Great. But the, he would go walking through the Agora with a lantern and people would ask him, what are you doing? I'm looking for an honest man. Yeah. It's <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> yeah. He's a great guy. And, you know, and, a great, and a great metaphor that, you know, there he has the lantern implying that, you know, this is sucked in darkness, even though it looks like daylight. It's the original moment. You know? Yeah, exactly. But we've got, but but you know, it, it, Diogenes Diogenes uh, would have uh, plenty of employment now because it, you know it is standard practice for people in our society to insist that you know we live in this uniquely enlightened time in an era era where you know we're closer to achieving justice and all these ideals and all these abstractions than ever before, and yet. Our society is in many ways a miserable failure and is failing more rapidly as, as, as the day passes. So, you know, Diogenes could walk through the streets today saying, I'm looking for progress. Have you seen any? Mm-hmm. And has a flashlight, which he's shining around, you know, making sure to point it on the, you know, the, the, the crumbling buildings and the people living rough on the streets and so on and saying, where's this progress you were talking about? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is there, is there, are there any aspects of collapse that you rarely get a chance to, to talk about or to mention? Um, no, actually, <laughs> one one of the great things about you know, once one one of the things <clears throat> I'm not fond of the internet, but it has certain advantages, and one of the things is that it makes it possible for viewpoints that are way out there on the fringes to find their audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and this has happened. I mean, you can you can also do it if you have a thriving magazine culture. During the 1920s, 100 years ago, um, there were there were small magazines that did the same thing, and people would would find out about them and so on. But um, the internet works very well for that. My audience is used to just about anything that's having to do with collapse, and in fact, they're constantly saying, "Well, what about this? And what about that?" So I think I've pretty much discussed the whole subject. <laughs> All right then. Well. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about our conversation? I mean, and also, of course, what are you working on, and what books of yours okay. could people well, put under their tree for Christmas? I guess. What? What? I, well, they, they should. Okay, they should get a complete set of all my books to put under the tree, <laughs> of course. But we'll get to that. Um, be, what I'd like to they need a big tree. They need. That's fine. Um, I'm good with this. Okay. Um, one one of the things I'd like to say is one of the one of the crucial points about getting out of the the burden of abstraction is that. We do not need all of these abstract things. We do not need all of these tokens of progress to lead a decent and even a happy life. Plenty of people have done that in in eras of decline with perfect grace. It does help if you stop believing that, you know, you stop waiting for the great great pumpkin or the great AI or whoever it is to rescue you. But... If you if you pay attention to what's going on, if you focus on the realities of your own life, you can actually lead a perfectly happy life for as long as you spend on this planet in this incarnation, and even though society is falling to bits around you. Many people do this, and you can do it too. So I, I don't want anyone to go, oh, there's no hope, and go jump in the Thames or something like that. Um, so that's that's what I'd like to be. you know my, my Christmas wish for everyone is that they will they will look around and say yeah things are going to bits but I can get by. And in terms of what I'm what am I working on now, um, I have a flurry of things coming out um, over the next year. I've been my my no, my tentacle novels my um, the weird of Holly and its and its companion novels all set in a kind of H P Lovecraft world seen through a, a funhouse mirror. Those are um, the seven books of the weird of Holly are now back in print. I've just done page proofs for the reprint of the other four tentacle novels. Um, so that's occupied a lot of my time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I am. I also have another fic, a new fiction series, a set of occult mysteries, occult detective stories, um, with 18-year-old Ariel Moravec and her her grandfather, Dr. Bernard Moravec, who is a serious occultist, in a non-existent town in some non-existent corner of the of the eastern United States. And those are fun. One of those is out now, um, the, the the Witch of Criswell. The next one, the Book of Hatan, will be out in the spring and so on. Um, I'm looking at, I'm working right now, digging through various books on geomatic divination to look at a, a new book on, on advanced geomancy. And I've got some other pl- some plans in terms of books on, on the nature of enchantment, which will rile a lot of people, I'm sure. So that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Well, sounds great. Um, Good. As always, it's been as a great always. conversation. Thank you. you I, I have had a great much? time. Mm-hmm. Thank you.